Hello, uh, here a brief video on how to start an instance in the uh, OpenStack environment that we have at Nationalis. Um, I didn't really uh, script this, so it's going to be a little bit of trial and error, which means this is going to be a very realistic simulation because none of us do this on a daily basis, so it's always a little bit of uh, clicking around. But here we go. So uh, I am uh, logged in in the uh, OpenStack web interface. Here, this is me. And so this is, you know, you would be given an account by uh, the ICT department, and uh, you have your login credentials, you log in, and then you see something like this. So then the way it's organized is that um, there's a whole bunch of different uh, projects and you will probably have been given a project by the ICT department. Um, and you can see the ones that you have access to in this pull down menu. Um, it'll look a little bit uh, different for you because I have access to more of them uh, probably the ones that you'll see are the ones that have been assigned to your research group. Um, so uh, we are now within one project and we can see the resources that have been assigned to that project. And um, This dashboard shows what the resources are. So in this particular case, I would be able to launch two instances maximum so that's like two virtual computers let's say and uh, across those two i can assign up to four cpus so think of these as the cores that would be available to your instance so for example if i make two instances maybe i would give two cpus to each of them or i can choose to make just one instance and give it four CPUs, let's say. This is the RAM that's available, so this is 16 gigs. Um, each of the instances can be assigned a, what is called a floating IP, so that's like the internet address with which we can access the instance from the outside. Uh, the security groups is, yeah, it has to do with access rules. Um, don't worry too much about it. Um, volumes are, think of these as something like virtual USB sticks or something like that. So uh, external storage that you can connect to an instance. And in total, these have some amount of storage. So this would be 100 gigs. Um, okay, so this is what we have available. And um, then here, these other... Um, lists are right now and empty so with because in this project nothing is running yet there's been no volumes um, there's a snapshot that I had saved earlier of uh, an instance that I used to have running within this project so here I just gave it a, a date stamp so this is from last year and then these are the uh, rules uh, for um, uh, access to and basically out of the instance. So this would have definitions for different so-called port numbers uh, across which different protocols communicate with the instance. Uh, later on, we'll see what this might mean. Okay, so let's go and try to create uh, an instance. Um, here we are in that tab. I'm going to click launch instance. And so here now we see, okay, this is the first one of two that I can create within the project. Let's give it some name like test. Uh, and then I click through to the next tab for source. So this is the uh, list of possible operating systems. 
that we can launch. Um, nine times out of ten, it's going to be one of these. So Ubuntu is um, the most commonly used Linux distribution. Uh, here in the list, it still gives us Ubuntu version 4, 14, which is uh, ill-advised. We're actually supposed to move away from it. Um, so, for example, you can choose uh, 16 or 18. Um, let's say we go with 16. So I'm going to say 16.04, and LTS means a long-term stable, which is a particular version of Ubuntu, which they uh, maintain for longer than other uh, sub-versions sub within the 16 range. So here we see that it's now been selected and added to the list here, and now we can move on. Now we're going to use. Uh, now we're going to choose a flavor. So a flavor is basically a combination of resources. Um, and I recall that I had uh, sixteen gigs of RAM available. Um, so maybe if I just want to max out that, that would give me the choice between these three flavors. So this column here is for the RAM. And then there's uh, different types of storage that I can choose from. Maybe I just want to max out all of that. Let's see if that works. So that's now been selected. And then we go to uh, networks. And then we're going to choose this one here. Um, the difference is, I think, having to do with whether uh, IP addresses are assigned dynamically or fixed. But I think we just have to go with this one. Okay, so let's do this. Um, okay, so now we are in a bit of a bind. So I think what we need to do somewhere is tell our uh, network configuration that we also want to use port 22. So port 22 is the port that is used by the SSH protocol, which is the one that uh, is what we use to um, log in on our instances. I don't think that's what we assign here. Um, in any case, you can see that the asterisks now have disappeared, so we're probably pretty close to having chosen, chosen everything that we needed to do. For security, I guess we'll just go with the default, um, but here's a bit more of an important thing, and this is the key pairing. So I mentioned that we log in on the instances using SSH, which stands for Secure Shell, which is a kind of encrypted way of sending Linux commands to a server and receiving the output. Um, and it works with a, a what's called a key pair. Um, so there's a private key which you have locally and which you must guide or protect uh, 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 and, and not share. And then there's a public one which is going to reside on the server. Uh, now OpenStack takes care of injecting that public key on the server side. Uh, I just need to take care of my local uh, private ones. I already have a bunch here. You will probably won't see this. So let's just say we're going to create a key pair. And uh, well, uh, in this case, I'm just going to call everything test. Uh, of course, uh, you're well advised to uh, pick something descriptive so that you still know what this was for down the line. Yeah. Okay, so it created the key, and you can see that it now downloaded it. Um, and so... Let's say I just... Make a little directory. Mm. 
move my key in there. So there's our file. And let's just have a look at it. So this is what this looks like. This is a key that is generated by uh, OpenSSH, which is the standard that is used on open source platforms. So here's an important distinction. When you are on Windows, you will log in on your server using a program called Putty. And Putty um, doesn't use open SSH keys. And so when you are given this key, you first have to convert it to the format that Putty is happy with. But I can't really demonstrate that right now because I'm obviously on a Mac. OK, so we have our key. Um, see what else we can do. So uh, configuration, This so this part here allows you to um, add additional uh, shell scripts that are run to add extra stuff to your instance before you even log in on it. This is something that I've never needed and I've also never done, so I assume you also don't need this. Again, this is something that I never use. Um, so uh, since the uh, asterisks with the required input are gone here, we're probably good to go. So let's click Launch Instance. Now we see that there's this spawning thing. So basically what's happening now is that somewhere in a server rack, um, a virtual uh, computer is starting up. So now it's uh, moved to running. And, um, so we can see the name that we gave it. We can see the image name that we're using, which uh, a key pair has been attached to it, the flavor. Uh, so this was the, uh, you know, the RAM, the uh, CPU and the storage uh, configuration. Uh, this is an IP address, but this is not the one that we can use to talk to our instance. So what we still have to do is to uh, give it what's known as a floating IP, which is an IP address that is actually visible to the outside world. So I seem to recall this might be somewhere here. Yeah, so here we have floating IPs. And uh, now we want to, I guess, give an IP to the project. So this is one of the two that we uh, were given as the total capacity to this project. Um, there's nothing else we can do here. We just have to click Allocate IP. All right, so now the IP has been created. So this is the address that we can use to talk to the machine once it's associated with the instance, and that hasn't happened yet. I think that was under here, yes. So here, we, what we have to do is associate the floating IP. Um, there's the one that we just created. And this is the internal one. So now we click Associate. So I think we're pretty much done. Um, I'm not entirely sure if we already have port 22. No. Uh, oh, yes, we do. So, okay, so here's what I just did. Um, for security, in principle, of course, a whole bunch of things can be configured. There's a whole bunch of different protocols that 
computers used to talk to each other over different ports. Um, I mentioned this thing SSH, which is one of those protocols, and I mentioned that it uses port 22. Now, if we go here to the rules, we can see a bunch of rules defined here, and what's important is that there's a rule for this port number here, um, and then for the protocol, um, uh, well, let's not worry too much about it. What's important here is that this port is now open. Okay, so then I suppose we should be able to log in. Um, and so on a Mac or on any sort of Unix-like computer, there will be the program SSH. So in my case, it's uh, on this look in this location, um, and so in this directory I have my private key, and now we're going to attempt to log in. So we say SSH. Oops. Um, um, this argument here says, well, we're going to log in using a key. And then um, all of these instances, all of these Ubuntu, Ubuntu instances that you can launch by default have a user called Ubuntu. And so the magic incantation is that you give the username that you want to be and then uh, the at sign and then the IP address 145. So that's the floating IP 136.243. Point four. Let's see what happens. So here it uh, looks like something like, oh, we're getting a warning. Um, just read carefully. It says, well, the authenticity can't be established. There's some sort of magical uh, key uh, fingerprint. And then it says, are you sure you want to continue connecting? So the answer is yes. And in this case, you have to actually type that out. So you have to Explicitly type yes. Now we do get a warning. It says, first of all, that locally now this IP address has been added to my list of known ho uh, hosts. But it also says, permissions 044 for test.pm are too open. Uh, so this is a little bit Unixy. Uh, what this is about is the uh, rights to the file. This is what that looks like. If I just do a listing, you can see here that with any file on a Unix-like operating system, there are three categories of user. Uh, so there's the user itself, that's uh, this first col column. And then there's the group that I belong to. And then there's all the others on the operating system. And so what it says here is that I have read and write access to the file. And then the group that I belong to, which is just a user group on my local operating system, so it has nothing to do with your research group or anything. Um, they also have read access. And then all the others on the operating system also have read access to the file. And SSH considers that uh, insecure. Right. What they want is that only you have access to your file. And so the way I change that is to change the file mode. I say, well, I only want the user to have read access to the file. Like this. Um, oh, that wasn't entirely what I wanted. Um, I think what I want to do is set the group to nothing. See, now you see that this group thing has been changed. And uh, the others also to nothing. 
there's a more concise way to do it, but then you have to understand how bit flags work and it's all, all arcane. So you see that now my private key is only readable to me. So let's try again. And sure enough, now I'm logged in. So now I can start doing work on my uh, remote instance. Um, I can uh, see what's there. There's nothing there in my home directory. Of course, if I look in the root, I can see that sort of the expected folder structure is there for a, a Linux uh, distribution. Um, I guess from here on, you'll have to uh, continue on your own. So um, let's just log out. Now, one more thing that I would like to add is that uh, whether you're logged in or not, this thing is just going to keep on running. And maybe that is a little wasteful. So if you're sure you're not doing anything with your instance right now, uh, it might be a polite thing to, uh, for example, just suspend the instance. So it's basically just like going to sleep, just like any other computer, which is probably for resource resource use or you know the climate or whatever kind of better to turn things off when you're not using them so it's uh, now going to sleep and um, yeah this will take a few seconds um, and there we are um, so that's it for now thank you